If you've spent any amount of time reading the papers we write, walking around poster halls and talking to other psychologists, you know that we are not all on the same page. One's exquisitely controlled lab experiment is another's contrivance. What is to one a powerful mathematical formalism is to another just gibberish. What some call a neural mechanism, others think of as oversimplified biological reductionism. Some focus exclusively on individual level performance, while others feel that theories that don't take into account social context are woefully incomplete. Now, of course, some disciplines lend themselves to certain kinds of approaches. Someone studying low-level visual perception has fewer reason to take social context into account uh, than someone studying, for example, prejudice or collective problem solving. But even for people working within the same discipline and using the same methods, for example, those studying young infants, while some might try to discover idealized principles that underlie development, others are drawn to complex interactions and individual differences. Some might stress innate knowledge, while others stake out more empiricist positions. In this project, we set out to take a pulse of where psychological science stands on a few general controversies and to see if people's answers were predictable, not just from their area of research and the methods they use, uh, that's to be expected, but also from some more general cognitive traits. Could it be that people who judge themselves to be more deliberative, for example, or those with greater tolerance for ambiguity, gravitate to certain theoretical positions? Here's how we went about it. We administered a survey to almost 8,000 researchers from psychology departments and some affiliated disciplines from around the world. Each participant did three things. They told us what research topics they study, what methods they use, what area of psychology they're in. They completed a number of individual different scales, and I'll show you what those are. And then they gave responses on a 1 to 100 scale to each of 16 controversial themes that I'll show you in a moment. For Many of the participants, we were able to collect their, uh, connect their data to uh, their publication record. I'll show you that data at the very end. Who are our subjects? As you can see, they span the field of psychology, from cognitive psychology to neuropsychology to counseling, forensic psychology. They study a variety of topics. These are free responses with some parsing. Cognition, for example, is included if uh, the person's response included the word cognition. One of the advantages of this large sample is that even people who study the, some of the less popular relatively topics, for example, language development over here, uh, that still includes um, 80 people. How do they study it? Using a variety of methods from surveys, these are again not mutually exclusive, uh, to interviews, to pharmacological interventions, and twin studies. Our sample spans ages and academic ranks. We were mindful of having to keep the survey of manageable length. And so in choosing the scales, we try to assess a broad range of cognitive, cognitive traits uh, that we thought might be predictive of where people stood on various theoretical topics. Now we come to the fun part. So these are, uh, I'll show you eight of the 16 themes that we probed. In choosing these themes, we have to be mindful, again, of asking about things that will be familiar to people spanning uh, different areas of psychology. We can't ask about a debate in working memory or language development, given that most of our sample doesn't study those things. Um, and um, using some um, series of validation studies, here are some of the themes that we came up with. Realism, to what extent are the things that we study in psychology, constructs like short-term memory, attention, motivation, are these theoretical constructs or are they real physical processes? People are split on this. Some think the things we study actually exist, others think that these are theoretical constructs. Stability, our essence, to what extent is an individual's personality stay constant over their lifetime. Again, people are split. So, so far, uh, the goal to find controversial themes um, 
is, is being met. To what extent is neurobiology or biology the key to understanding human behavior? Most of our sample thinks it is not. To what extent are mathematical models important? To what extent do they signal that we have a greater understanding of some phenomenon compared to a verbal model? People are split. Nativism. To what extent are human cognitive capacities like language and reasoning, um, to what extent are they innate rather than they learned? A big peak right in the middle, people, um, uh, uh, the, the, the idea that uh, it's nature and nurture both has really been hammered uh, in. Uh, but again, people span uh, the range. Should we focus on discovering ideal or abstract rules, or should we study deviations from idealizations? Here people are split, but many are not sure how to answer, and so they indicate that they uh, really didn't know and just put that marker in the middle. Holism versus the study of individual processes. Does our field proceed better if we focus on studying individual processes or in studying systems as a whole? People are again quite split, uh, but most actually endorse holism. To what extent is the homo economicus, the rational self-interested agent, a good model of human behavior? Psychologists don't think so. Now I'll show you just a sampling of the data. Um, the results come in roughly four forms. There are validations, things which, if they're not true, there's probably something wrong with our survey. Um, results that sort of confirm stereotypes that, that are you know, likely to be, to be true. Um, things that are maybe a bit unexpected. And then some results that are uh, of perhaps genuine scientific interest. So validation. People using math models think math models are important. That's good. People uh, using case studies as a method don't think math models are important, much less. Neuroimagers endorse biological explanations. They think that they are key to understanding human behavior. No surprise there. Social psychology is social. People, um, uh, the sample as a whole endorses uh, the importance of social context, um, but social psychologists endorse it even more. Some stereotypes. People who use computational or mathematical modeling are less into the whole social context thing. Still think it's quite important, but less so. They do think that human minds are fundamentally the same. Researchers who actually talk to other people, however, uh, don't think people are the same. Those who identify as working in evolutionary psychology endorse nativism. Men, more than women, think our work should be more informed by evolutionary thinking. Women aren't so into evolutionary thinking compared to men. Women are more into social context. And they're less likely to think, women uh, are less likely to think that what we study, the processes we study, are real rather than psychological constructs, theoretical constructs. Neuroimagers, of course, tend to study individuals doing individual tasks, uh, but that's really a limitation of the method. Um, but it just so happens that they think this is just fine. Social context is only moderately important according to them. Those studying atypical populations tend to endorse biological explanations. We can now look at some of the relationships between the so-called controversial themes and the individual difference scales. Deliberation, the extent to which people uh, like to plan things and to deliberate over their decisions, is positively associated with the belief that people's personality is stable over their lifetime. Um, it's also positively associated with um, the home economicus rational um, model of, of human behavior. Those who tolerate ambiguity tend to endorse studying systems as a whole rather than focusing on uh, individual processes. 
and they tend to reject biological reductionism. Uh, those who have a greater tolerance for ambiguity also are less likely to think of cognitive processes as real phenomena rather than constructs. One of the more robust relationships we found is that between spatial imagery, this is uh, more in the scientifically interesting category, um, the relationship between spatial imagery and endorsement of mathematical models. Even more so the use of mathematical models. So those who use them uh, have greater spatial imagery as assessed through um, uh, a mental imagery questionnaire. Although spatial imagery and object imagery are moderately correlated in our sample of band 0.3, um, it is spatial imagery specifically and not object imagery that's associated with both the use of computational uh, models and endorsement of their importance. Now what we can then do is um, put it together through some factor analysis so we can reduce the 16 themes into five factors. I've glossed the labels right there and uh, the various uh, scales, uh, tolerance for ambiguity and so on into these four factors. Um, and I'll just go through a few of the associations real quick. So people who have greater uh, breadth of interest, who describe themselves as more verbal, who value art, um, are less likely to endorse realism, less likely to endorse the importance of mathematical models. They're more likely to endorse kind of social contextualism and reject nativism and a kind of homo economicus mind as a computer uh, model. People who are more deliberative, this, this um, factor uh, carries the most weight, uh, are more, it, it's, it's basically the flip side of uh, the first factor. Uh, here are, just to visualize it for you, um, so those who um, are less tolerant of ambiguity, more black and white in their thinking, endorse nativism and are less likely to endorse the importance of social context. Visual imagery, I mentioned, is correlated specifically spatial imagery with the use of mathematical models. Visual imagery as a broader factor is positively associated with uh, universal realism and biological reductionism. And then there is finally a weak association between dominance and the kind of mo uh, the computer is a good model of the brain, homo economicus rationalism factor. Um, we were able to link about 70% of the authors to their records in Web of Science. This allowed us to compute distances between people's patterns of citations, the similarity of their abstracts, and then relate them to differences in their responses to our uh, themes and on cognitive traits. Um, a positive beta here means that uh, people's papers are more similar. So not surprisingly, those who um, work in the same subdiscipline as uh, so a social psychologist, for example, um, those who use more similar methods, and less so those who study similar research topics, uh, these are from the multiple regression model, tend to write more similar papers. Controlling for these three similarities, their, the similarity in their endorsement of these controversial themes, and to a lesser extent, their similarity on these cognitive traits uh, are further predictors of how similar their papers are. Uh, all of these are also predictors in patterns of citations. So not only are they likely to write more similar papers in terms of abstract similarity, they're more likely to cite uh, all the same people. We've created a data dashboard. I'll paste the link uh, that you can use to explore um, some of these uh, patterns for yourself. And I want to end on a prescriptivist note. Uh, we often approach our work with different assumptions. And scientific disagreements, I think, are probably just as often about um, data, or maybe less often about differences in data, than about differences in our general biases. I think we should try harder to make our assumptions explicit, both to researchers who study uh, the same things we do, and to those from other areas. Thanks.